right, my friends, welcome to episode 425 of Prof and Dev Play Games. My name is Larry, the professor at Prof Plays Games on Twitter. Over there is Anthony, the dev at Summer Speak. How you doing, man? Pretty good. You just said 425, and I'm like, every once in a while it just hits. I'm like, Jesus, 425 You're like, that episodes. can't be right. <laughs> That's, I'm like, it doesn't always, and we record every week, and it's fine most weeks. But there's sometimes a number, you say it, and you're like, wow. That's hundreds. That's multiple hundreds of recorded a lot, episodes. A lot of weeks, man. I think about it whenever I think about <laughs> the year. I'm like, we've been doing it since 2020, the end of 2025. Or, God damn it, 2015. Not, 20, <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, 425, man. It's, that's awesome. Um, uh, I'm glad to still be here doing this with you, talking about games. First, yeah. never, never things not to talk about. This week, we're going to talk about indie development which you know something about and also the funding picture around indie mm. development we're gonna talk about games we've been playing which for me is just fucking final fantasy uh, <laughs> um and you i it's probably bellatro we'll find out um but before oh, we begin um just want to give a heads up in a couple of weeks we're starting a new um a new podcast um rpg backlog with with me and friends and we're going to start with uh travis who's been on this podcast before and anthony will pop in when he can uh and we're playing through final fantasy 12 which anthony's talked about on this podcast he's played god what four times three times something uh, like that and started started numerous times beat like three times oh total. nice okay and once was the original version, and then twice. Original the version, game. and then, yeah, and then the international Zodiac job system version mm -hmm. through emulation, and because there wasn't an English release of that game. That was the thing. The story of me ripping my discs to ISOs, getting the Japanese only ISO of the international Zodiac job system version, running a fan made patch that took the English loc. <laughs> from my isos and put it into the international zodiac system. wow that's crazy and then i so i beat i've beaten those two and then i beat the zodiac age as well awesome so well anthony's been in our little sub discord helping us uh kind of map out where we're gonna go we're gonna start recording episodes and we're gonna launch that podcast uh, i'll be talking about it more but just uh hope you'll follow us on that journey i'm i'm just so thankful this year that i've decided to like play shit in my backlog because <laughs> there's been just there's fucking gems they're so good man i can't wait to talk about it later um so just let people know about that um but we are here to talk about the state of indie investment i guess yeah um so you know we've heard some things recently about uh the well drying up so to speak with game pass and epic games exclusives the money not really being there for indie devs i don't know if you've heard something similar or, or you know how what could you say about how that's been a boon for indie development or not? Um, and what have you heard about that, the investment drying up? Uh, it is, to mm -hmm. a point. Like, I would say a couple, especially during the pandemic years, money was flowing freely mm -hmm. on that stuff. It would be pretty easy to to pitch a game and get probably some pretty good amount of money there, um, especially on, like, the Game Passes and through Unreal as well, uh, Epic but, Do you know what that, um, you know, not talking about like your contracts or whatever, but just in general, what people in the, in the ether have talked about what those contracts kind of look like? Um, well, I knew not to get the specifics on numbers, but like Game Pass is structured on a yearly contract. And mm -hmm. what it had been before a lot, and it really came down to how good are you at negotiating with Microsoft? Ah, um, got it. Because if you can negotiate, negotiate well, they'll just pay you a lump sum for the year. Of, and you say, well, if I'm on Game Pass, this is how much money I would lose from sales, roughly. That you're basically getting up front from Microsoft. Yeah, and you just yeah. get it up front from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, that's generally how it is. And so there was actually just a huge wide, uh, wide discrepancy on what people got through Game Pass because if you're not good at negotiating, you're probably going to get less. Mm -hmm. um, right. But if you're, if you're a good negotiator – and kind of stickler, you're probably going to get paid quite a bit more. Um, and it wasn't being done out in any fair form. This is just straight business and negotiations, and you better be good at it. Um, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't one set contract that you're just signing and they were giving, offering to people. Um, Microsoft will try to lowball you, um, and it is your job to not let them do that. Yeah. So, 
as any negotiation. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, but that stuff was rolling it pretty free there for for a while. I mean, Microsoft's trying to get people into Game Pass a lot, and we've talked about previously and kind of the numbers coming out. That's kind of tapering off. Like, it's not going up nearly as fast as they want. Right. Um, and they're actually now at the point of like all tech. Uh, how are we making money more than anything at this point? Are we are we in the black? Or are we in the red with this service? Um, and so there's, I think, a recalibration happening of being like, well, how how much do we need to pay to who? What maybe be a little bit more selective on what things we want to do exclusives for? Like, I bet they paid Atlas a fair amount for um, Persona 3 Reload coming to uh, Game Pass yeah, Day 1. But I bet that, but it's a key game, one. It's a big yeah. game. Yeah. And I, I expect you're going to see more of that because – what they need are big games that draw people to the service and small indies are great, but they're likely not the thing, uh, bring in new people in. Um, in fact, that's what, sometimes like the, it's the content that keeps you there. You kind of like look yeah. around and see what else is there. But like, um, persona three reload. I mean, I turned on my Xbox and downloaded it and played it for five hours and I wouldn't yeah. have done that for other games really. Um, so, so I think, and you talk about like the indie, market there it is getting squeezed down and you're it's harder to get those deals um through there there has just been the industry itself um probably in the past year there's just been like a a tightening of belts across all the investment um ways to to earn it to get investment seed money uh angel investment um venture capital all that stuff is kind of dried up pretty hard because right. interest rates are so high, it's, yeah, it's much not easier. To, anymore, it's yeah. just much easier to put their money into other types of investment that give guaranteed returns. Right. Um, because that's what uh, when these venture capitalists and all these other people are investing in games, studios, and um, and projects, they want a return off of it, and they're hoping to get a return. It's still a bet. Now there are things that there's like zero betting to getting a return of like five and a half percent, close to six percent at some points um, of their money. And they'll just rather do that instead of making any risk whatsoever. Um, yeah, it seems like you can you can take a It's easier to take a gamble when the interest rates two percent or whatever. Yep. Is, but when it's fucking seven, eight, nine, whatever. Yeah, that seems Why? Kind of scary, like sure. and so. And you have to understand, like most of those, the venture capitalist um, firms, they're just there to make money in the end. So they're going to – it's not like they're like, oh, we don't – they they never loved or hated games to begin with. They were just an avenue to potential making money, um, and that avenue is riskier right now. Um, will that change in the future? Likely, but uh, for the time being, it, it's – I would say the venture capital route um, and those kind of publisher deals even are less likely for the moment. We might see a lot more switch back to the crowdfunding for a bit. Um, Interesting. That happen it happens. It's, just, it's cyclical in that. Um, we'll just go where you can think you can find the money. Like if you pretty much. Pool, if there are people who want to play your game and you can get 25 bucks from each of them, you know, a million people or half a million people or whatever. God, you know, yeah. That's your budget. Um, it's viable. Yeah. I don't haven't don't have a lot of insight into Epic so much. Mm -hmm. um, just that I've heard that they're slowing down. They're not trying to get as many exclusives or um, uh, pay as much for like their uh, free giveaway games, basically. Yeah. But I don't have a lot. Not a huge insight in there. Like there's not a lot of my contacts have gone have done stuff specifically for Epic, but. I know that it's under a similar similar type thing. Epic is trying to like rein in their spending some. Um, well, yeah, I mean they they what let go four hundred people yeah uh, recently and I don't know looking for other Sp ways to bring money spun, in. spun off sold off Bandcamp that they had bought right. and yep. like yep. They, they're trimming their company back down again so that they can be very uh, easily profitable right um, because they bet on the metaverse I guess and it's not taken off um whatever 
I will tell you at GDC this year, no one was talking about the metaverse that I Thank saw. Thank God. Thank God um, people stopped saying that fucking word. And no, and no one was talking about NFTs. I heard last year was a pretty big from uh, System Era folk that went in 2023 to GDC said that like the show, like Expo show floor was just everyone hawking like Web3 NFT oh. crap. Um, yeah. And there was like none of it there this year. AI was the big thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, but sure. even then... Uh, I would say questionable, like not nearly as like aggressive as what I've seen out of like the year before for NFTs. <laughs> so I feel like AI is probably a little bit of a bubble as well, but maybe not as big of a bubble. Um, maybe because there just isn't as much money going around, flowing around. Cause I have heard that of like, when you talk about tech bubbles, the VR bubble was huge and got a ton of venture capital investment. Yeah, right. Um, NFTs were really huge and got a bunch of initial like big web, three investment let's go um but the ai stuff has gotten some decent investment not nearly as as big as those um even though i'd say that all the stuff that has been shown and working through ai is probably uh more um practical than the other two so far that's Uh, that's what i was gonna ask because it seems like of those things that you've mentioned ai as much as you know there's some fear around it or you know whatever some consternation some angst some I don't, I don't know optimism as well it seems like there are some tasks that it could be useful for that yeah. maybe people would be like oh this is actually a thing and not this figment fucking coin blockchain shit so yeah but i think it leads back to that same thing is there's just not as much money being pumped into the um to tech startups right now and that includes game startups right and, so even if logically they believed it was a thing that would make sense they're like we don't we're not putting money in right now yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that is my overall high level take on all of this. Um, you did have some stuff on like what the budgets on stuff might be. Um, yeah, because there was there were some words about uh, in regards to the well drying up that some people were saying. Well, I'm in the industry. We're pitching games still, and we're still getting yeses, but the yeses are less money. So like, you know, we're getting yeses of four hundred thousand. We're getting yeses of a million. We're getting yeses of two hundred fifty thousand. I just wonder. You know, I guess it depends on scope, but like, wh- let's say four hundred thousand. You, you pitch a game, and someone says, "Yes, we'll give you four hundred thousand dollars to invest in this game." What does that get you? What, I mean, really think about that, like, know? what's the team? How big is the mm-hmm. team? Because mm-hmm. I always average about a hundred thousand person a year. A um, hundred thousand per person per year. So four hundred thousand would be like we got four people working on this thing for, for one year. For one I, year. I don't think you make a game on that. Honestly. That's what I, that's what uh, I wanted to know. Or yeah. you're or you're a one or two person dev team who are taking less money and yeah. working a couple years on a in a smaller game to get it out right. like okay, 400,000 is pretty small budget I'll be honest yeah that's uh, that's kind of what I wanted to, to frame that as because if that's true I'm just going to use team cherry assuming team cherry is two people which it was it's not anymore but two people 400,000 they could they could take you know like the yacht club folks took way less money for a while you know just banking on their game which yeah. worked out for them but you know, you could take less money, work for a couple of years, and then just fucking pray that it hits and it doesn't hit, and then you're just fucking done. Then you're done. God, that's yeah, okay. Welcome, welcome to the indie, indie and startup. Yeah, life. yeah, yeah. Um, right. it's, it's very stressful. much. Yeah, because I mean, there's so many factors that play into whether or not your game hits or not. You know, Power World yeah. fucking hit for some fucking reason. Um, but you know, Ender Lilies came out several years ago, and uh, you know, I think it's a niche game. It's it's got its little, it's got its fans, but it's nothing that blew up. Um, yeah. God, that's woof. Remind me never get into game development. <laughs> uh, yeah, it can be real stressful, and I am thankful every day that I've, for the most part in my career, I've worked for places that are stable. Yeah. Um, because boy, do I know a lot of people that have. Their entire career is just made up of one to two year stints at places because the places just collapse um, over yeah, and over man. and over. And I'm like, I can't I couldn't deal with that stress at all. Um, I'm I'm reading um, Press Start, Jason Schreier's second book. Yeah. And it's basically about that, about different, you know, even Ken Levine. It was Ken Levine working on Infinite and then the people who've gone from place to place to place. And that was one place they were in for two years before they moved on to the next one. And God, that's just yeah. that sounds really hard and speaking to him like that this past week there was a bunch of stuff on judas like there was two yeah. there's the ign 
interview that was a while. But then right. uh, Skill Up got an interview, and it was another. It was like an hour and a half with him as well, and they got to play the game. And I listened to that one as well. A lot of the same information, but yep. the one thing that reminded me there is that like, and weirdly, Kill Levine is still somewhat humble in this, but I also think it's because whenever he got into the industry. People talk about System Shock 2, and I do as well, as being this incredibly great game. It sold like shit. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, like, highly nice. regarded, but he's like, yeah, it sold, like, maybe maybe over 100,000, 200,000 units total over its life. Not enough to keep Irrational functional. No, God, no. Like, it was, um, it was really rough for Irrational for a long time. Um like they do, they were not a stable company um, until like Bioshock. They got that kind of infusion of money. Um, yeah, they had to really initial like pitching that and getting getting. They they had um, partner money as well to help for that development and really stabilized um, a lot of that. But I couldn't imagine working there when they started, they started as just like three people in an office and looking glass studios because they were all ex look all looking glass employees and they left to make yep. left. I would say left in quotes because they literally just moved into an office in a looking glass studios. Yep. But reading that chapter and it's just like how I think of Ken Levine is like, I don't know if Titan of the industry is right, but you know, a, a well-known person of the industry is well like how rocky it still is for even for him and the people around him and in his orbit. And it's just like, yeah, how turbulent all of this is, and how is. also just the, the the artistry of it. Like it's yeah, we churned through iterations of this game because it wasn't the vision. It wasn't the vision. And then finally, you're like, we got to fucking put this thing out. So here we go, boom, boom, boom. We're making all these fucking, you know, yep. we're we're finally at the point where we have to make decisions. Elizabeth is not going to be as I don't know, expansive as we thought she was going to be in Infinite, and the NPCs are not going to be as complex as we thought they were going to be. We got to fucking make decisions and get this thing out the door. Yep. Um, so interesting. And at Judas, you know, God, it's been 10 years since he gave the narrative Legos talk. Yep. I was in the um, room at that talk. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. <laughs> of course. Cause I was at GDC that I was the last GDC I went to until this one it was my 10 years ago. Um, wow. You haven't gone in 10 years. Yeah. And it was to see, and I was there. And of course, if he was speaking, I was like, I'm going to be here to listen to him speak. Um, yep. and yeah, it was that whole talk. Um, but yeah, it's it's a rough. I, this is my thing. Uh, it's hard to just really make someone understand how hard it is to be successful in games and be yeah. stable. Um, that be that indie or AAA. AAA, you might have a better chance, but you're you are have seen in the past year like how that is not the case either like you can right. 1900 layoffs at microsoft and activision blizzard because they're just done yep and i've been interviewing people this past week um because we have at system Air, we have three design roles or had three only two are still up on the website because we had hundreds for one of these roles um mm-hmm. 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 apply but over all three we've had 400 over 400 apl- applicants yeah that makes sense and that, and that like and, talent and quickly, was right? deep. Yes, it's God, so deep. Crazy. And like yeah. I've been phone and screening people that like who have just immense, immense talent and uh, work history through major projects, and it's insane that they're looking for work to me. Um, yeah. Right? It, it's crazy. Um, it's sad. It, it really put it into perspective of just being like, holy crap. Um, there's a lot of people and especially even in design, which design is typically the place where you don't see that much. Um, you see a lot of people wanting work in design, but there's just few jobs, but now it's full of people who are doing this job for a long time. Um, who are just out of work. Um, yeah. Um, I, so I guess it means that when in, you know, in a general situation like that, when you finally land a person from that pile, you're just like, this person's fucking incredible. You know? Yeah. And, and like, so we're I've all the other people. 12, I assume, you know? 12 people. Some of them were no, not because I was like, I wouldn't say I've screened anyone that I'm like, oh, absolutely not um, because of skill set. It's like, no, because your skills don't overlap specifically what we need for this role and like sure. the needs of my team. But like everyone I've interviewed, I'm like, you're 
really cool people. Man, I'm sorry. I only have one spot to give. Um, yep. For each of these. Um, Cause wow. I'd like to work with a lot of you, yep. but it, really it's sick. a, it's rough, I will say. And it's, I mean, it's probably no different than any other creative field though. I mean, I'm not in film or TV or writing or music, but games are still a, still a, uh, a creative outlet. Um, it's hard to be successful in that and make stability from it. Yeah, because it, it, I mean, it's, it's not true that it only depends on taste, but like it, it depends on more on taste. And like I was going to reference the interviews that I'm going through for, uh, you know, hiring professors or hiring deans, hiring administrators. Like we have usually have a sheaf of like really talented people, um, but they, I don't know if it's a, um, the skill set isn't totally dependent upon taste to the degree that art is right. Like mm-hmm. you can be amazing at some aspect of design or whatever, but it's not quite, doesn't quite fit the aesthetics of, you know, the project you're working on versus like, for me, it's more about like, I don't know your, your pedagogical approach or the way that you manage people. And it's, it seems like a broader skill set that is, you know, I think there's a lot of different way iterations of how people can do those things that are still acceptable. Yeah. Um, versus maybe if you're looking for a very specific thing for a very specific role, it's just like, you know, 500 people could be, um, just fucking amazing, but not quite the right fit. And that's just, that's wild. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be rough for indies for a bit. And yeah. you mentioned before the, uh, recording, there's like this triple I thing. Is it yeah. the triple I awards? Like I briefly saw stuff on this. I was. So it's not awards. It was written the port the 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 headline was here. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's developers of Dead Cells, Darkest Dungeon, and Slay the Spire yep. launching their own Triple I Game Awards. It's not. It's a fucking okay. showcase for Triple I Games that's happening April tenth. Okay. They're talking about basically. They're talking about. It's hard for them as like like I don't know big indies, but not as big as Triple A to get any space at like a Game Awards or at an E three or whatever and be remembered. Like they get sure. the, the memory of their game gets stomped out by the big stuff. Um, and then there's uh, these some of these things for like small indie games, and they're too big for those. So like we need there's a space here for what we need, and that we're gonna have this yeah, um, 45 minutes of world premieres, gameplay trailers, demos, drops, um, but it's not awards. So I'm not sh- I'm still not sure why that fucking headline still has that. Um, yeah. So it's basically it's a it's a fucking showcase, which is yeah. great. I'm excited. It's um. You know, those are studios that we like, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll see what it is, I guess. Yeah, but. uh, But to the point, yes, things are things are rough for investment in the game industry right now. Um, A lot of the VCs have dried up at the moment are just not interested in putting it stuff to risky, risky areas right now. The big publishers have kind of like pulled back a bit because they want to effectively stabilize themselves and then um the investment firms and there's there were a few of indie investment places um colon Kulon knights was one that i haven't heard about in a long time um they they helped i think they'd helped with stray potentially hmm interesting um they were an investment a group of investment um and they've they're putting out some stuff, but maybe not stray. They they like invested in uh, Chia Chia, um, Sifu, Garden Story. Um, what else have they done? Like just a bunch of these like indie games. Um, sea of Stars. They they were kind of like an investment firm in there. They do some stuff, but I'm not hearing as much coming out of them at the moment. Um, and I think it is just because it's pretty pretty hard. Um, yeah. So I, I just it, it's going to be a hard time, I think, for for indies um, and people starting out right now. There's always challenges, though. Like I said, you might need to shift your your strategy for getting investment right now to be more crowdfunding based. Um, Find alternate solutions that aren't just looking for someone to to give you a bag of cash up yeah. front. 
um, which is unfortunate, but uh, that is that is the state I think of the game industry is that always is kind of in flux, um, and these cycles happen every few years. Um, well, it sucks maybe for people who I mean for everybody, but for like studios who are like almost done and they're like we just need you know an infusion of fifty thousand, two hundred thousand, or whatever, and it's yeah. like that's not coming, and our fucking game is grinding to a halt. So I don't know. Yeah. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Where it goes. But I wanted to pick your brain on that, so thank you. No problem. Um, now I want to pivot to what Bellatro you've been playing. <laughs> what? Well, play, I've played more Bellatro. I, I beat. I have now successfully beat it with, I think, four different decks. Oh, nice. Okay. Overall, I'm, I'm getting the sense. I know how to play the game now. It's sure. really cool. It's, um, I mean, if you like poker, it's a really fun, like, twist on poker. It's incredibly mm-hmm. creative in, in, the, uh, in the mechanical sense of, like, what, you, what it's tweaking with poker hand rules um, and how to play. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty great for the the scale of game it is, and for just how simple the visuals are overall. Um, that, that that is the reason why I didn't pick it up for Fantasy Critic. Is I was like, I think the the visuals are going to hold people back from really giving us a chance. But boy, was I fucking no wrong. no. They do a lot of like what I call the low hanging fruit, even for like simple two D like just playing card visuals. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of like pizzazz for those a lot of good screen shakes and little particle effects like um i play it and i notice a lot of places where they're just putting in just just little things so your interactions with the game just feel really good all the time um if i had played it, i probably would have picked it up <laughs> in my fantasy critically i just never had played it um, it's it's the i, I, and was, I was like the sweet it's spot really, i got the demo so i had a week and a half i could have done it and i didn't and i was like yep no, I don't think it's going to review well, but here I am picking up fucking... I don't fucking know. Why did I pick up Donkey Kong and fucking Mario? I should have picked this up, goddammit. Oh, oh, yeah, well. we can quickly talk about... Uh, so I did try to counterpick the Mario. Oh, thing, hey, yeah. And it didn't... It actually just said that drops must happen before counterpicks happen. Oh, Because it was just a time-based thing. It's like this doesn't exist on the, on the, the chart that anymore. That makes sense, because... I don't know if it does make sense actually because actually, if you know well, I think the gonna... bidding I think the bidding would have been better in my opinion of carrying yeah. it like like if we bid the same amount like well I don't know how that works cuz it's dropping do you have to pay for dropping Yeah I paid 2 bucks Yeah I have a feeling I'm like I feel like it should have happened at the same time and look at the bids and if you if the bid is tied you still get to drop no problem but yeah. if the counter pick is higher it stays and it gets locked as counter pick. I th- I think that would make for a more interesting game. But it would, yeah, because you you would want to be, you know, at that point we're both thinking I'm dropping fucking Mario because it's not coming out, and you're like, no, fuck no, you're not dropping it because I'm gonna get those zero points on my counter pick. Yeah. It, it should have let you keep it. Yeah, it just says that it was gone already. So because I count I counter picked it with three dollars, which it didn't take because it wasn't there anymore. So. Um, oh, you picked up nine souls. I did pick up nine you souls. You motherfucker. <laughs> I was surprised. I was like, maybe he'll do I feel like we're going to fight over this one, but nope. I was going to wait a little bit longer, and that was It got a release date. I was like, I'm just going to take it. Yeah, if it had, that was If it didn't have a release stupid. date, I probably wouldn't have, but yeah. they, they, they did the release oh, date. Oh, nice, dude. Okay. Um, good good pickup. <laughs> um, and I yeah. kind of picked Unknown 9. Uh, yeah. Just because... I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's up in the air. It could be. Yeah, anything. exactly. Um, exactly. I don't feel like there's a lot, a lot of good counter picks coming my way based on what you're picking up. So. Yeah. Um, game is no longer eligible. Cannot counter pick a game that no. Other yeah, it's on the list. Publishing. Yeah. That's so, so the, interesting. So the drops happen first. That's curious because I'm looking at. Oh, it does. Yeah, it does. Because the time. Yeah, the drop yeah. happens before nine o'clock. Oh, so they do it so the drops happen before bids even start. Oh, yep. that's just, that's a them thing. Got it. Yep. Okay. Got it. So. All right. Well, um, if Mario uh, Mainline 3D Mario platformer comes out, then you'll have a chance to look and buy well, that's it. That's true. I could bid on it now. I could try you to could. pick it up for if, uh, if something randomly gets announced over the next six months. Um, I doubt it, but it's possible. 
I mean, if that were to happen, I would be spending all my money to try to fucking pick it yeah, up. Yeah, so. get that back. <laughs> yeah, although you have more um, money than me right now. You have no, I do. I, no, I have fifty-one. Do. Yeah, that's right. Um, um but uh, so yeah, play Bellatro. Wish I could have picked that up or had played it earlier. Totally would have. Um, it's a great game. It's great yeah. on the deck. Um, oh good, really yeah. I've heard it runs really great on Switch too. So that's yeah. Uh, it doesn't sense. surprise me. Yeah. It, yeah. it runs really well and it's easy to control on the handheld. So thumbs up. It's a great, a great thing when you're just like laying on your couch and just need oh, something yeah. to play. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. What else did I play? Um, uh, I started up uh, firing through Unicorn Overlord again. Nice. Um, I'm in the the third area. Um, the north, the frozen north. Um, it's all the wear creatures. So I'm getting, still getting thrown tons of new, <laughs> new characters. <laughs> still. That's amazing. And it's new so classes because they're all wear, wear classes. And so oh, I yeah, get yeah, like yeah, wear like, rangers like, and like sure, fox sure. scouts and owl wizards and all sorts of just crazy crap. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the game is still great. Um, I kind of. Vanillaware just put out today. They've sold five hundred thousand copies of it so I far, saw that. Um, which is great for them. I think this is probably it's getting pretty far. They're selling a lot. I don't know, probably one of their fastest selling games ever, if not the fastest selling game for them. So um, I, I've understood the same thing that it's a good game for them. I was surprised. That seems a little low for the buzz that I feel like it's getting. But I guess I'm in the RPG circles, so I don't know. Yeah, um, no, it's still pretty good yeah overall. it's kind of a big tail i think too so yeah um i think it's doing great for them it's still gorgeous i'm really really loving it um a friend here uh he played and beat it on the switch and i was chatting with him on saturday and he's like yeah i picked it up on the ps5 because i won trophies for it <laughs> and he's playing through it again to platinum it on the ps5 um he's like they just deserve the money anyway yeah. So, and I agree. Yeah, Vanilla Wear has put out something pretty great. Um, in the end, uh, hopefully, I'll maybe trying to finish it up, and then I'll probably go back to Rebirth um, and finish up Rebirth. Yeah, can you remind me how far along you are in Rebirth? Um, I'm p- past Costa del Sol, okay. and I'm past the Golden Saucer area okay. like the first time there and mm-hmm. quite a bit i'm like going into the next golgaga gold it's where zach's from it's like okay yeah right foresty jungle it's new, gonna be a big new open area and i know i have like it and one more big open area to do um before the game the game's just enormous um yeah yeah, the thing that I keep hearing from people or reading from people is like this thing is goddamn enormous, and I'm doing everything, and I'm just I'm loving it. I'm loving doing it. It is lot. Lo- yeah, I think I just needed a. I think what I've heard the most is if you don't. What's great that I'm taking a break is to just if you force your way through it, doing everything, it's going to be a lot. But if you yeah. space it a little bit, you'll enjoy the experience a lot more. Um, because I believe there's like. 50 side activities in every major area. Um, right. I've heard those a lot. lot. Yeah. <laughs> and they're fun and it's cool to do and explore, but holy crap. Um, but I want to finish that up. Um, but yeah, Unicorn Overlord. Uh, Battle of Exile had a new league, so I dabble. I've been dabbling in that. Um, I just saw that. It was like Necropolis yep. or something like that. Yep. 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 I was like, you, oh, I bet uh, Anthony's playing that. <laughs> you kill creatures t- and you get their corpses and then you have there's now this like graveyard area you go to and you bury their corpses and craft items from their corpses okay (laughs) yeah yep that's the thing uh it's still path of exile and actually from many weeks ago i was playing last epoch uh last epoch i unfortunately i just don't like overall i find it bland i find it pretty bland and boring as an action rpg um Neat has like a lot of neat mechanical systems, but actual just playing it, I'm just like, man, I find this really boring. Unfortunately, yeah. um, the moment to moment just didn't grab me, and the maps all felt very samey, and the just the enemy design, just a lot of stuff. I was like, mm, yeah, not doing it for me. Uh, Path of Exile, it's insane in its expansiveness of mechanics and things, and 
I would say depth, but it's just it's not elegant depth. It's depth by depth by sheer amount of things. Uh, um, okay, which is Path of Exile, and you just accept that. Yeah. Um, and I I do, but I'm like, oh, I like playing this a lot better, even though I've played this so many times before. It just, um, the moment to moment gameplay just fills fills a um fills more engaging, and there's always new builds I can try and different skills, and they feel pretty radically different so uh, i dabbled in that i've probably put a few hours in since the the league came out on friday um not a ton i'm not trying to push too hard at it um and then well this is a great transition to what you've been playing um, oh my god all the final fantasies but because of you and travis talking about final fantasy 12 i was like i should play that again um or start again because i had a, a a save pretty far along on steam deck and i was like well i could just start again it's fine um, restart or pl- continue yeah, just, re- just restart okay uh because i'm pretty sure i'm exactly where you two are now in my oh, time okay. of playing today because i know exactly what to do i'm just like yeah, yeah of course you do here yeah. go here go here do this do that um i feel like it's pretty straightforward so far like i'm not getting lost or confused and i'm like no. i usually do <laughs> so i'm I, uh it's... just wait just wait uh, um, okay okay it's, it's coming the 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 guardrails will be removed and then you'll be left Got to uh, your own <laughs> your own sure. devices to figure sure, out what sure, to sure. do sometimes yeah. um but yeah i picked that up again and was just messing around on while i was uh sitting at fairy docks today um on the steam deck and yep i just like that game a lot it's so far I've taken notes first time I really have taken notes while I'm playing because I'm going to do this this podcast and I want to make sure that I remember this shit because I as I've said it many times to you all I forget details I remember the overarching thing um, which is why I don't mind spoilers at all in fact I watched a um, overarching story uh, for Final Fantasy 12 on YouTube and probably got I don't know probably a third of the way through it before I was like okay I've got enough to get where I'm going right now um that just gives me a nice schema for the whole thing but i don't remember the details um but it's uh i mean my my experience at least so far has been it reminds me so much of two things one final fantasy 14 just from either the way it looks or the way where you start i'm not sure what it is um so, then I'll, okay <laughs> yeah go ahead. i yeah. can say there okay so uh the primary character designer was the same character designer uh, Akihiko Yoshida, who was the character designer on Final Fantasy Tactics, Vagrant Story, Final Fantasy XII, Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, okay, because it looks and very near similar. Automata. Oh, interesting. I... He's the main character design. He's the reason Two B looks like Two B. Um, <laughs> what really? Okay, that's interesting because um, the podcast I've talked about with you off, Mike, at least uh, the Axe of the Blood God RPG podcast. Yeah. I joined their Patreon, so I'm in their Discord, and that's the that's the game for the next month is Near Automata. Um, I'm not gonna yeah. have time to play through it, but I'm gonna play a little bit of it. That's interesting, because um, yeah. boy, I mean, I swear to God, like 12 and 14 looks aesthetically very similar yeah. to me and from then, a uh, cursory glance. Hiroshi Minigawa, uh, who was part of Quest Corporation, who mm-hmm. came to Square through with Matsudo, Matsudo Matsuno, and Yoshida, like they all mm-hmm. worked on quest on battle ogre back in the mm-hmm. day mm-hmm. like that's that's their team and tactics and tactics ogre um minagawa was the director and visual design and character texture supervisor for 12 he was he got special thanks uh he was the lead uh ui designer for 14 he was the art director for 16 and some Ooh. ex expansions in 14 as well um but but he yeah he is the art director on 16 like there's a there's a trajectory of these people that joined did tactics did vagrant story were tapped by the execs of square instead of being like this b team to take do a mainline final fantasy game and now they just kind of drift between different versions of right. Final Fantasy. Um, but that's a reason probably why there is like that connective tissue there is because a lot of these same people have worked on all these games. That makes sense. Um, there, there was something there that like, I, you know, other than the aesthetic, like there's feel like there's things underlying it that like connect it that I couldn't put my finger on. Yeah. That makes sense. 
Um, the other one that reminds me of, and this is, I, I believe, a no-brainer because it's the same person, but um, Crimson Shroud. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if the character designer worked on that too. There's some, I mean, it was a 3DS game, but like it does, I, I guess there are a couple things, like maybe the characters look similar to me, but like, that's probably not right because those are like more stationary and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I don't know if this is right because I've only been playing for like an hour and a half, like the, it's not weirdness is the wrong word, but like the weirdness of the world, like it is, <laughs> there is like a, um, uh, what's the right word? Like it's, it's slightly askew from what I would expect. Um, sure. And it's really interesting because of that. Like the writing, like so far has been superb. And like what I've expected, like when they're trying to, when Vaughn's trying to get back through the gate um, and Miguelo comes out and kind of distracts the guard with wine and then they all kind of like are able to come back in um, from the desert there. Um, yeah. Isn't what I expected to happen in that moment. And the way that it was written and explained and like the, it just felt like in a different game, that would be like a one sentence throwaway distraction, quick run in the gate or whatever. But it was like a very well voice acted by John, Joe, John, uh, John DiMaggio. DiMaggio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and the, like the amount of text just for that section was just like, there's so much depth. Like I'm, there's so much depth to that scene that didn't need to be there, but was put there because they care, I think. But also the NPCs, like I find myself talking to many, many NPCs mm. because the world building just from the NPCs is superb so far. And it's just like, oh, my goal was to not jump into more Final Fantasy VII because <laughs> I'm so in love with every character in that game and the story that I don't want it to be over. <laughs> so I want sure. to get – I'm fiending for that love. Uh, that I, f- I haven't felt this way since The Witcher, since Witcher 3. Um, that like I want it again, and I'm like maybe I'll find it in another Final Fantasy, which is why I asked you guys like what's your favorites, and you're like twelve. Okay, I want to I'm gonna do this. And I'm glad Travis jumped in, but I'm already finding it. I'm already finding like this is gonna be great as well, and it's just it's fucking awesome, man. That's cool. Um, yeah, uh, Matsuno Matsuno is the writer on these games. Like, even he... though he left halfway through or whatever, he was still. Uh, his, his, I don't know how text. when he left. But probably everyone mm-hmm. that's given interviews on it talks that he that most of it was done by him okay. um, by the time he left. Like that wasn't some stuff may have got shuffled around a little bit towards the mm-hmm. end. But yeah. and that's the thing I will say is I don't think it ends as strong as I would like it to. I think there's right. a lot of there's a lot of really cool ideas and thoughts and it's told in a like. As you go along, you'll see that the story there's there's two camps really on this is people focusing on like oh Vaughn's a weird character to be the main character mm-hmm. and not liking him as a main character and I do that in quotes because I don't actually feel like he he is the main character he is the audience point of view but he's actually not the main character of the story mm. and he's viewing the main characters of the story as it goes on um, yeah right and that. And some people just don't like the way that framing of mm-hmm. things. They're like, I yeah. want to follow the main character. And it's like, well, you kind of are, but you're doing it from Vaughn's perspective, um, right. which isn't unheard of in in fiction to do to do stuff like that. Of like, no, um, no of course and, not. And Vaughn serves a very specific purpose. And Vaughn and Pinello are like, this is what happens when there's big wars. They're they're orphans and like getting the perspective of all these big like. What is the street level ramifications of big empires clashing? Um, and that's that's kind of their role in the story is being like they're they are those pe- people and kids. It's sometimes my favorite fantasy literature. Fantasy is my favorite genre, but high fantasy drives me nuts. Where it's like the the kid who's like the dragonborn, and like you you think he's nothing, but he becomes the king of the world or whatever. But like low fantasy is just like no, the, the fucking regular people who are affected by all this shit, like. Yeah. Let's see what what life is like for them and through their eyes. And yeah, and that's kind of where the story kind of keeps its focus is, is, or at least not focus. That's its point of view as they get drawn into a much larger story that's happening. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. But they are not they are not the antagonists or protagonists of that story. <laughs> like right. they're along for the ride. They're stuck in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> they can't get off even if they want. <laughs> Um, right, the inertia of the big guys and girls or whatever pulling them through. Yeah. 
Uh, speaking yeah. of the fucking Lady Ash, fucking, I mean, it's off screen, so I guess I don't know if it sticks or not, but like, she killed herself. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> it's these people you get to know at the beginning, he goes to war and gets fucking killed, and she kills herself. Herself, and then the the captain is traitor, and he's imprisoned, and like, yeah, enjoy all those characters you met for the first beginning of the game. They don't, they're not in there anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about Bash, right? Or Bosh? A Bosh. Yeah. I mean, I. I know what happens there, so yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like wow. Okay, here are these people. Nope, they're all gone, and now you're this street urchin, and yep. it's him and Pinello and uh, some other woman. Curdy, Curry's curious. Kites. I don't know. Kites. I don't know. That's, that's. I don't think that's a party member. Um, nope. That's, no, yeah. just an NPC, um, mm-hmm. just like Miguelo. But yeah, I yeah I have no clue. I really, really do like this game a lot. Clearly, as I've played it so many times. Um, yes. But it's also one of those ones I'm like, yeah, I think it's there's a certain acquired taste to it as well. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like, you know, I've heard you say it before. I've heard other people, I've read other people say it before. And I think I just keep coming back to my experience with Crimson Shroud, which when I said I was going to do that, that you were well. like, you had a thought. You're like, I don't think you're going to stick with this. And I did. And it, uh, that, I think, is a very much an acquired taste, just like you just said. Um and I feel like that's more, way more niche than this one. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, I yeah, just, no no mainline Final Fantasy is going to be that niche, exactly, to be exactly. honest. Um, no point, yeah. So I just feel I just I already I'm already excited to get off the podcast tonight and play more. And I was like, OK, wow, I'm glad I have something that I'm excited to play that isn't Final Fantasy seven Rebirth, because all I want to do is play that fucking game. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's just like it's uh, Final Fantasy, like. I, I was thinking earlier the way to say this to you is 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 terrible, but I feel like I've been wasting my life playing video games because <laughs> because um, I put 390 hours into Team Fortress 2. Sure. By myself. I didn't play with friends. I played by myself for the most part. Um, so this is separate from Rocket League, which I did the same amount, but I played with friends the entire time and it was a great experience. Team Fortress 2, 390 hours. How many awesome JRPGs, RPGs, could I have played with that time and had, like, I feel like I'm and had this experience. Like, I feel like I'm just waking up to the fact that wow, I should just be playing RPGs. I, the the story, the characters is just so rich and fulfilling. Like, I cannot, I cannot believe how impacted I am by this by remake story and the, mm-hmm. the Final Fantasy VII compendium going through and reading all the shit, um, and how, you know, like Bellatro, the great game. It's not going to make me cry. <laughs> you know, fucking yeah. Team Fortress 2, great game, not going to make me cry. Like this, like, fuck, I felt so many emotions from Witcher 3, from Mass Effect 2, from this. It's like, hello, keep playing these kind of games, man. And I just and- felt like I didn't have enough time for them in my life. But I've, I've been playing Rebirth, not Rebirth, God damn it, Remake since January, you know, an hour, hour yeah. and a half a night. That's it. I don't play during the day. I play at night when everyone's asleep. Um, this was spring break, so I had a little more time, um, which was nice to kind of wrap that game up. But like, man, I can fit these huge games in my life. Not Final Fantasy fourteen. That's too much. Sure. But these other <laughs> ones, you know, and it's just like, wow, yeah. what have I been doing? I've been playing the wrong games. <laughs> and it, it helps that you can play a lot of them on on deck or switch as well. Yes. Like, yeah. um, and I would say, like, the thing is, is coming into this just the genre of RPGs now, like you've played big ones and stuff, but there are so it's so rich with games mm-hmm. that if you're just going looking at your backlog, you say, or just stuff that's released in the past, like you could pay, play 10% of that and you'd get nine, nine out of 10 games or better. Yes. The exactly. entire time. Like right. you're just like, yep, there's so many of these that have so many cool things. Um, uh, and you don't even have to put, play any mediocre ones. Um, Right. Like I, I can just spend my time playing nines and tens and, you know, sevens are great sometimes, yeah. you know, I can have fun with those, but just, just in my backlog alone, like I was at a friend's house today for our, our kids were playing and we were talking and it was Tom, he was on here talking about okay. um, Tears of the Kingdom. And I told him about this idea of doing this podcast where going through the backlog and playing backlog RPGs and he was, just, he just lit up. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> wait, what, tell me more about this. And I was like, do you want to be on deck for the next one? Find an RPG in your backlog that you've always wanted to play and haven't played. I bet I probably have it, and we'll play through it together. Uh, and he's just like, oh, my God, I can't wait to look through what I have. <laughs> so it's just like, I don't know, just talking through the idea of being able to 
to get into those big, rich games in small chunks. And it just, he was talking about how it feels so daunting. He was, he was explaining to it me about uh, the No Man's Sky update that just came out. And he's like, yep. I love No Man's Sky. I keep wanting to play it, but there's so much. I get overwhelmed and I just, I feel like I'm not making progress. And it's like, you know, you could make little chunks and I'm, God, I'm so happy right now, man. <laughs> I'm so yeah. happy. I, have I just a, went to Open Critic and I was like, I want to see games, all platforms, all time rated by score. And I'm and like, okay, it, when do we hit RPG? What RPGs mm-hmm. show up here at top? Uh, of course, Zelda's in there if you want to consider the, like Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom yeah, RPGs. Sure. They're mm-hmm. kind of, I would say, yes. Uh, not the deepest of RPG systems, but uh, RPG adventure ish games. But yep. uh, Persona 5 Royal is the is number t- number ten on the Open Critics highest rated of all time games. And that's going to be another one that I, when I finally get back to it, that's I'm going to feel the same way, right? I imagine that Final Fantasy VII, the characters, the story, it's the characters, Persona Five the Royal, characters. same thing. You know, that's definitely part of the motivation of picking up on Switch uh, physical. Final Fantasy uh, VII Rebirth is at ninety three. Um, Witcher Three Wild Hunt, yep, ninety three score as well. Um. Blood and Wine at 92. Like, you just look at this, and I'm just like, man, you can just go through all of this. If you want to get into the Soul stuff, Demon Souls, 92, the, the 2020 uh, yeah. remake of it. Um, Dragon I Quest le- 11, um, if you want to yeah. go different. And, like, Dragon Quest another, has a totally yeah. different vibe yep. than Final Fantasy. Very, very different. But people love that one. I put yeah. I put 10 hours into that, and I, it's I very enjoyed silly. it. But... It's a silly game. Yes. Like, they are way sillier yep. and more cartoony, and yep. um, which is fine. Like, there's, there's just such a variety in this genre. Um, man, I should post played Nier as well. I have Nier. You have Automata? Automata? Yeah, I got it for eight bucks off of Amazon at one point. Oh, that's right, you did. <laughs> it was like super cheap, and I was like, "And ga- it's the game of the Yorha edition." I was like, "Yep." So I just have it, and I'm like, "I should play this at some point." Um, if you if you ever listen to Acts of the Blood God, um, the Pantheon um, podcast, this for April basically is going to be that game. So even if you don't play it all, playing some of it and listening to that conversation, man, yeah. um, could be cool. Yeah, like I, I think. If you just they're like, I'm just going to focus on this right now, this type of game, you'll have more than you could ever imagine. Yep. Xenoblade games, all of yep, them. That's true. Xenoblade that's right. Definitive and two and three. Um, those are all incredibly like nines. <laughs> um, yep. And super long. Yeah. Um, a lot to do on them. Well, and there's so much payoff, like with um Future Redeemed, the DLC for Xenoblade yeah. 3. People were like, it wrapped everything together. It was fucking incredible, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. that's what I'm looking for, man. I'm looking for these. I'm looking for, I want to buy the book of the game. I bought the fucking book of Final Fantasy VII <sighs> Remake, and I've just been reading it all weekend. And re- Oh, this is going to love this. I've been reading it. My daughter, you know, she went with us to the concert. And yep. she got the Cloud stuffy, and she, you know, likes Cloud and Sephiroth. And um, she's reading the book with me, and she's you know, wants to watch a little bit of it. So I watched a little bit with her and I realized like, this is not, this is T for a reason. This is, we're not going to do this, uh, but she saw, I was watching a recap of the original with her, the story. Sure. And I guess the point where Sephiroth comes through the ceiling and stabs Aerith. And my daughter's mm-hmm. like, w- w- what just happened, daddy? Like Sephiroth killed Aerith. Wh- why? I, I, I don't know. He just did. Remember he's the <laughs> villain of the game. I don't like him anymore. Can we, can we stop watching this? Can we just watch Kirby? <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, she was done. <laughs> she was yeah. done. Uh, yes, yes, you are also affected by this. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, um, really funny. And that is cute. really funny. Yeah. yeah. I don't like him now. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and she did. I was like, she has a thing about villains, but she's like, no. Usually the cute, like, it's a silly villains, right? This was the first time she saw a villain like do something really fucked up. And she's like, nope. I no, nope, I don't like this daddy. I don't like how I feel. I don't like how he makes me feel. Fuck this guy. So that's funny. Yeah. That really funny. Um, but yeah. Uh, so you're playing some twelve. You've played remake and beat remake, dude. Finished it. It's one of my favorite games ever, and it's not just. <laughs> and I, I think it's like it's. 
it's like I know I just finished it, so I need to like have some time. But I think about you when you finished Mass Effect Two, and you're like, I just want to restart it, and you yeah. did. All I want to do is restart remake, and it's like, don't do that. I have other things to play. I, I'm not going to do it, but it's all I want to do, I want to go find everything I didn't get. I want to find all the materia. I want like there's extra dialogue scenes yep. like in the fucking train yard when you're uh, not the train yard, but you're in the sewers and you're following the lights to get. God, I can't remember exactly where it was, but when I turned around to see what would happen if I didn't follow the path, Barrett and uh, Tifa were like, no, no, we go that way. But apparently there's a way to I read it in the book this weekend to circumvent them stopping you and walking all the way around in a circle back to where you started. And when you do, you get special dialogue from them. <laughs> I was like, I want to hear what that is. Um, going up the stairs instead of the ladder or instead of the elevator in uh, Shinra Tower um, was awesome because the dialogue. I don't know if you did. Yeah, that. did you go? Yeah, I did yeah. that. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's just I want to do it all over again. And it's like all of this is the story, the characters, like the dialogue, the writing, everything's fucking awesome. But the thing that really I kept coming back to beyond all that was like how the game is structured in the bosses. I felt like every single boss was unique. I had to have I had to think differently for almost every single boss and figure out how to like beat them. What what stuff I had to use to beat them? What what uh, material I needed to slot in? Um, the way the bosses um, they just felt unique from each other. Um, going up to the um, I guess the whispers at the end the um, mm -hmm. the three different whispers that are basically like Tifa, Cloud, and Barrett um, before Whisper Bahamut, and then getting on the Sephiroth. Like everything was just like. Every it was every boss was like ratcheting up, and then I felt like I would beat the boss with like I don't know a, 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 ten more seconds than I would have died kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. it just felt like an edge of my seat the entire time. So like the gameplay alone was just incredible, and then layer on the characters and the story and the visuals and the voice acting is incredible. Um, and God, everything <laughs> was incredible, and I was like, man. My friends have been telling me for decades that this is a great game and a great story. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. I remember watching Travis play this game and just being bored on my fucking mind uh, watching him play this game. To, to be fair, and I've said this before, the 7, 8, and 9 RPGs of that time and before, there's a lot of really boring parts in those games because yeah. the grinding is not is not that exciting, and there's right. a lot of grinding. Um, the remakes are pretty great as because they expand it, and they get rid of the grinding. <laughs> like, you're just playing the game. Um, and mostly it's always interesting. Um, there's, I have a lot of memories of 7 where I, I, I really enjoy 7. But there's a lot of parts of it where I'm like, could this just end, please? <laughs> can, I just, can I just beat the boss, please? <laughs> like, can I be strong enough to move on? Um, so... I, I don't look I look back and like I nostalgia wise I like those games, but I'm like they are by gameplay wise they could their strengths could be strong. <laughs> could could be better. Um, and and there were some parts of remake where it was like this is going on a little too long. Like for example, and I think this is a, this is an example of where this happened and why it was a good thing. The 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 ghost train yard, I believe is the mm, one. Yeah. Yeah, where it just felt like it was going on too long, but it was you, Aerith, and Tifa. Yep. And as you're going through, like, yes, it just kept going on. It's like this fucking stupid maze. Like, I could see how this played out in the original, like this fucking mazy kind of getting through, yep. trying to find the right path or whatever. But with the remake, they had this was the this was the chapter where Aerith and Tifa like became friends or became closer friends or became mm -hmm. getting to know each other and just talking about random shit. And it's like I just could listen to them talk all day. Like, this is great. And it made that whole thing awesome, even though remove them and just be like, can we just fucking end this, please? Yeah. Um, so there were parts of that in Remake, but god yeah. damn. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I did every side quest that I could in the three that were open to do a bunch of side quests. Yeah. Um, I wanted everything from this game, and I, I just feel like we've been, as you said at the beginning... We've been doing this podcast since, you know, for fucking eight years. This is episode 425. I feel like I'm only now, like, ascending to your level of, like, understanding about how fucking uh, incredible video games are. You know how, <laughs> you know, it's like, what the fuck? I've not, I've just, it blows my mind that this game's so old. Remake is not old. 
And I think remake's the reason why I'm into this and yeah. can now appreciate the old one. I definitely played the first part of seven through to getting out of Midgar or whatever, and it was like, okay, this is fine. Um, but I just this is the right game for me to like understand what this genre does to you. It's like reading when I read Lonesome Dove and obviously Game of Thrones or a Song of Ice and Fire, but like Lonesome Dove specifically stands out as a novel that like changed me because of how rich and deep and the characters and the story and everything. And it's just like games can be that. And I've known that, but I haven't experienced it that much. I experienced with Witcher and Mass Effect 2. And I feel like now with this one, it's the third one. that's just like a punch to the head. Like, dude, play these games more. You fucking idiot. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm, I'm really happy. All right. Yeah. <laughs> this is my, um, I'm animated this episode. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, it's exciting though. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, get a little palate cleanser with some a bit of twelve and hit rebirth up and uh, continue your journey. Um, yeah, I'll finish. I started the Yuffie DLC and I'll I'll finish it. Oh, She's right. an, a different and interesting character. Um, but I definitely I want I want my characters back. Although this is in the middle of remake, basically where this story takes place. And yeah, Biggs. I hear Jesse talking. I saw Biggs. Yep. Um, which I mean, spoilers for remake, I guess. But fucking Biggs was alive. <laughs> There's <laughs> a couple people alive that shouldn't be alive at the end of remake. Yeah, uh, Zach's um, alive. At yeah, the end there. that that is not that is not the story that happened before. Um, and that stuff continues into rebirth. Like they're they don't just drop that stuff. Like this is I don't know the answers yet. I have not. Yeah. Been, nothing's been revealed in that way of like what's going on. I have theories, but. Uh, it's still I I don't I don't know why there's a why Zach and Biggs are al- alive they shouldn't be and I am like is it multiverse is it different mm-hmm. is it uh is it multiverse in that way is it split timelines is it, I don't know I don't know at all um I don't think anyone does right now specifically um I haven't yeah, been spoiled at the end of Rebirth maybe at the end of Rebirth we know uh but as of Two thirds of the way through Rebirth, I have no clue. Um, I'm just more confused by it. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like the, what I've heard of the ending makes it so that it really is like, remember, this is Act Two of a three act play, and you're not gonna get everything you want out of it. Um, and actually, like speaking of Biggs, I hadn't brought this up. Uh, you'll notice his voice actor in Twelve. Oh, okay. Who, who I don't know if you Balthier. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. He's so good yeah, as Buffy. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so excited whenever I, I didn't know he was going to be Biggs in remake. And I heard his voice and I was like, this is amazing. Um, uh, Emery, Gideon Emery, I think is the voice actor. Yeah. Gideon Emery. He'd also does stuff in uh, destiny t- um, as well. Oh, cool. So he's gotten around. Yeah, there's a bit of points like he has a kind of a distinct voice, um, mm-hmm. a little bit, um, just his inflections and everything, and uh, his just general accent. It's British, um, and I'm just like, there are just times when I play games and I'm like, that's Gideon Emery, and my love of him started because of hearing him as Balthier in um, Final Fantasy yeah, XII. Sure. So um, I love his get... voice as as Biggs. Yeah. Um. So it's. It's very funny. So you'll get to hear that. Um, maybe not this week while you're playing. I think I have, when I broke up the chunks, I think you'll meet Balthier next, your next chunk of time playing. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, by the way, for helping us break that up. So it helps no us kind of schedule out what that's going to look like. Um, God damn, what a great time. Yeah. Um, okay, anything else for the podcast today? No, I think I'm, I think I'm good. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for listening. If you like us, please rate us on your podcast service of choice. Um, And we'll be back next week. You know, we're heading into April. There are rumors of a Nintendo Direct, so why don't we just get back on the train? We'll be back next week to talk about the Nintendo Direct. (laughs) Yeah, we're all the April Fool's news. Um, Oh, God, no. It's April Fool's tomorrow. Fuck. (laughs) Yeah, just get off the internet. It's all going to be paid. Oh, Um, I fucking forgot about that. Yep. (sighs) Okay, yes. Not good. (laughs) Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. We will see you next week. All right. Later, everyone.